Hello everyone, I'm Yan, Product Manager for the BigQuery ML. Today, we will introduce a new feature called Multivariant Time Series Forecasting. So this feature uh, provides our customer more accurate and uh, powerful results by incorporating the covariant, also known as the side features, beside the target time series. For example, if we want to forecast the future ice cream sales, we're not only uh, using the past sales data as our target time series, but also the external covariance such as uh, weather, location, etc. In today's session, we invited uh, our customer, Johan Matthew, who is the senior data scientist from Headlight and Google Cloud software where engineer Hao Ming Chen to join us to provide you a real life use, user use case demo and a product feedback session. So before I hand over to uh, Johan and Hao Ming, I will provide a little bit background regarding our customer Headlight. Headlight is uh, the next generation agency. Uh, they are building to scale the next generation of the consumer product. The team, brings together the performance marketing, uh, the design, and the data science in order to unlock the long-term growth for the emerging startups to the uh, global brands. So the current, the, the current problem they are looking into uh, is to determine the aggregated uh, conversion volume for the downstream matrix, such as subscription and cancellation. Um, then I will pass this session to uh, Johan for a demo. Johan, over to you. Hello. Today we're going to be running uh, a multivariate time series analysis on uh, ma some marketing data. This is our uh, data set, Cohort's Public Age, and it uh, contains uh, a number of marketing metrics. Um, this table uh, ha has been cohorted by uh, Cohort Age or more specifically install age. In this case, install age is the number of days after a user has installed. So for example, uh, a cohort age of zero means uh, the actions that users took on the day they installed. Uh, um, a cohort age of 101 uh, indicates the actions that, a user, that, that users would have taken uh, 101 days after they've installed. So, uh, what we've done is we've averaged all these uh, values across uh, while, while grouping by cohort age. Uh, we also have a cohort age pseudo metric. Now, as we can see, cohort age is an integer value, but uh, time series models generally take in a timestamp variable as their time series variable. So what we've done is we've uh, uh, we've added we've created a new field by adding an arbitrary date to the cohort age. So for example. Uh, in this case, we've taken the arbitrary date as 1st Jan 2020, and um, to get this cohort date pseudo, we add the, the, the cohort age value to that uh, as number of days. So for example, uh, cohort age zero corresponds to 1st Jan 2020 itself because you're adding zero days, whereas um, cohort age 54 corresponds to 24th of Feb because you're adding uh, 54 days after 1st Jan 2020. <clears throat> um, we then also have the eight time dependent uh, variables uh, that, that have been labeled input metric 01 to 07 and target metric. Uh, now, all of these are the variables that actually change over time, which is, uh, that is to say that they change as, uh, the, as the number of days pass uh, since a user install. We have qualitatively separated these out into input metrics uh, 01 to 07 and target metric because um, input metrics 01 to 07 have uh, come earlier in the user funnel and as a result we have accurate reliable data for that whereas target metric uh, comes much later in the user funnel and um, because of that and because of the way that uh, attribution networks work nowadays um, we we very often do not get uh, that data, or even if we do, we end up uh, it, it ends up not being very reliable. So that's the one that we are trying to predict for any any given uh, future cohort. Age. So let's say uh, we have data on how users behaved in the first seven days or the first thirty days. We we try and predict how they would behave 
let's say 60 days down the line or, or a year down the line. Um, now, getting into the creation of the uh, time series model, we use the standard BQML uh, model creation uh, statement. Um, we specify the model type as Arima plus X reg, feed in the timestamp column, uh, which is our cohort date pseudo, as well as the, um, the, the metric that we're trying to predict, which is in our case target metric. Uh, the training data that we use is uh, cohort ages D0 to D400. Um, so we train the model on uh, those 401 days or 401 uh, rows. And we run the predictions for 30 days after that. So D401 to D430. We see that uh, this Arima plus XREG model is created with uh, features uh, cohort age, which is the numerical value of cohort age, as well as the uh, input metric 01 to 07. Uh, the, the timestamp variable is not given here. Um, and because we specified, if you see here, we specified auto arima true, so it actually um, cycles through different values of P, D, and Q um, and, and figures out the optimum value. Uh, Coming here and running and evaluate to see how it performed on the test data, uh, we see that we get a mean squared error of 31 uh, and a mean absolute percentage error of 2.48%. Uh, so uh, our business requirements generally uh, state that we need a mean absolute percentage error for predictions to be less than 5%. So in this case, it does satisfy uh, our business constraints. Uh, what we do now is uh, we also compare it against how um, a, a more basic multivariate linear regression model would uh, perform. So in this case, without any time series analysis. Um, coming here, we quickly run the create statement. Uh, this, uh, in this case, we specify the model type as linear regression and we uh, pass in the same training data, which is uh, D0 to D400 of uh, values of cohort age. Uh, except the cohort date pseudo, because that, that was uh, an artificial metric that was created purely for the time series model. In this case, we uh, will not be needing that. Um, and then we predict the model for the same uh, D401 to D430. We see that the linear model has been created with the same set of features, um, cohort age, as well as input metrics 01 to 07. Um, and running the evaluate, um, we can see here that the mean squared error is 107, which is which is uh, more than three times higher than the one we got uh, with the time series model. But more importantly, we can see there's a huge negative R squared, uh, implying that the, the model has performed uh, really badly on the test data. So uh, for example, in this uh, scenario, um, the multivariate time series model would be the only one that we'd be able to use to actually uh, predict um, values of the target metric um, or basically down funnel metrics uh, a, a certain number of days after um, the user has installed. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the demo, Johan. I have some questions related to uh, our product. So the first question I have is based on the results, in what area do you think a multivariate time series will be helpful to you and your company? So. Uh, uh, the BQML multivariate time series model helps us uh, predict uh, downstream behavior of user cohorts uh, in a privacy safe manner, and it helps us do so early on. So uh, like I mentioned in the demo, one of the issues is that these uh, downstream metrics are generally not uh, reliably captured by attribution networks. So this helps us uh, capture this behavior early on and gives us additional inputs while reviewing and adjusting our performance. Um, the multivariate nature of the time series forecasting helps helps us to capture uh, the time dependence a lot better than if it was just a traditional univariate uh, time series model. I see. Sounds great. The second question I have is: Anything you think we should improve further? By and large, we're quite happy with uh, the BQML uh, implementation of the multivariate time series modeling. Uh, the fact that they are uh, written in SQL ensures that they are in general easy to integrate. Uh, in an ideal scenario, one thing we might like is uh, for, for all steps of creating and deploying these models to come integrated with orchestration systems like Vertex AI, uh, because we already have like an end-to-end uh, -end analytics pipeline to schedule and automate most of our data science workflows. 
So having this also uh, be part of like an automated pipeline would uh, would be like the ideal scenario for us. I see. Thanks. So the third question I have is: Any other uh, forecasting features you want? Um, I think uh, one nice feature uh, that that would maybe reduce like a couple of steps from our uh, uh, implementation would be if we we could use integer values in the time series variable as well rather than just timestamp based values. So uh, what this would do is help reduce some of the additional data wrangling on our side. I see. Thanks for feedback. So the last question I have is regarding. Uh, productivity. Is there any improvement uh, comparing with your existing workflow from the following perspective? Like uh, how long it takes, uh, how many resources, and uh, the skill required, like uh, SQL, Python, R, etc. Absolutely, uh, I can uh, say that it definitely helps in that regard. Uh, we, we uh, given that this is done in SQL rather than Python, uh, it helps us distribute a lot of the tasks among both data scientists and data analysts and help us be more flexible in our resourcing. Um, like I mentioned in our analytics pipelines, a lot of our core frameworks are already in uh, SQL. So uh, BQML helps us to enhance those data transformation frameworks to also include predictive modeling. Whereas earlier we would have had to like implement that in a Jupyter notebook and then uh, we would need additional MLOps to handle the orchestration between BigQuery and Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, this makes the entire uh, pipeline uh, a lot more streamlined for uh, use cases like this. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, yeah, um, last thanks again for your time doing this uh, demo.